Well, welcome back to Face the Nation. We got a lot to talk about, and we got some good talkers this morning. Some of the best in the business, and also they're pretty good writers. Tom Friedman of the New York Times uh, still with us, as is Wall Street Journal columnist uh, Peggy Noonan. She's a former aide to President Ronald Reagan, of course. Uh, joining them here, David Gergen, who worked for both Presidents Reagan and Clinton, now at Harvard, and the former Bush White House speechwriter and aide Michael Gerson, who's now a columnist from the Washington Post. Well, we better pick up here. Tom Friedman says uh, the, these people in the Taliban are not 10 feet tall, and, and Peggy Noonan said, well, wait a minute here. Let me just elaborate on, on that point. <laughs> Having covered the Arab-Israeli conflict my entire adult life, I've watched the Israelis arrest, detain, or assassinate one senior Hamas official after another. We got the senior guy. And sure enough, there's another one that springs up right after him. Mm -hmm. that's, that's number one. Number two, I mean, this whole business with Guantanamo, we can't move these people into our country, into a super max prison. They might fly off the roof. I mean, we have built these people up. I'm sorry, you know, into giants. And I'm not saying it's not important to release them, uh, that, the, that the, you know, the details of this case aren't irrelevant. But come on, let's have a little perspective on here. You know what? I'm going to sleep okay tonight, whether these guys are in Qatar, whether they're in the Ritz there, or whether they're around the block. Um, it's, it's a much bigger problem. The real problem is get the heck out of Afghanistan. I see some raised okay. eyebrows over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would be sleeping better if I had a sense that the administration had a real plan as opposed to a desperate dumping. If the administration had said to Congress, this is how we're going to make sure these five serious operatives and strategists for the Taliban are going to be controlled in the future. They won't be in the game. There seems to be no plan. There seems to have been a dumping and a hope that it will all turn out okay, and a trust that if it doesn't turn out okay and these guys turn bad and do bad in the future, that's okay, because we'll all have been, we all will have forgotten by the time that story blows. You know, I must say that I, uh I do agree with Tom when he says, you know, we always have to go and get our people. We can never leave our people behind. But what happened after that is the part that I, I kind of have a problem with, this, this rose garden ceremony and all that. Michael, uh, you were at the White House. Sure. Uh, how did that strike you? Well, I think part of the problem here is the president told a simple moral story, the return of a hero when in fact it was a very complex moral story, ethical story, geostrategic story. So he gave a tragic choice, the trappings of victory, and then he alienated a lot of people in the process, alienated members of Congress who didn't feel consulted, but alienated members of the unit that the man came from yeah. by declaring him as having honorable service. They felt compelled to object because they know the meaning of honor. And it's different from what the administration was talking about. So I think the, the president now is talking about this as a political football. I think they provoked these reactions that have undermined their own fairly reasonable choice. And, and, uh, and uh, Susan Rice, the uh, national security advisor, uh, says that uh, he had performed uh, honorable and, and, and served with, with distinction. distinction. Uh, do you think maybe she wasn't briefed or how did... <laughs> Uh, you can I, ask I, that no, question to everybody, to that. Bob. <laughs> She's clearly briefed. Uh, Bob, I think she overspoke. I, I don't think she meant to leave the impression she did. Uh, and she's tried to correct it. I think she would have been far better off to come out in the last few days and say, look, I made a mistake. This was not what I was talking about. I, I, I wish I'd expressed it in a better way. But the fact is, the way it came out, I think, plays directly into what Michael was saying. What the administration has done is won the argument that they did the right thing in going in and getting this guy. Getting Bergdahl out was the right thing to do. I think most of us here at the table, I think probably all of us at the table, would agree that that's right. Mm -hmm. But the way they then presented it ignited this firestorm. Uh, because it showed so little understanding of how people in the military, in the active duty military, saw him and saw what he had done. Uh, and I, I think it, in some degree, reflects the gulf that is between the 1% who serve today and the rest of the civilian population. Most of the people who work in the White House have never been in the military. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that they just didn't get how angry, how offensive people in the military would find it, that someone who had been found in the original Army report, they said, the report concluded he deliberately walked off. Now, to the military guys, that's basically about desertion, and a lot of those guys in there went into tens, if not hundreds, of operations to try to find him. 
and to try to save him, which was the right thing to do. But people were killed in that process. Now, you can't say Bergdahl is responsible, personally responsible for those deaths, but in the minds of the people in those operations, had it not been for those, that search, those people might still be alive today. Mm. Uh, I find it uh, also just, I guess, for want of a better word, interesting that we have uh, this report coming out in your newspaper this morning, Tom, uh, where uh, Bergdahl is apparently telling people in the hospital that he was captured, I mean, that, that he tried to escape uh, while he was in captivity, uh, after he was uh, caught and brought back, they put him in a metal cage, they tortured him. I mean, this was a horrendous thing. Uh, if that story is out, why wouldn't the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee have been briefed on that? I mean, uh, I would think that'd be something she might want to know before she came on Face the Nation. And it would be something that it would be helpful for the administration to to have their allies understand what happened and be able to talk about what happened. Instead, everybody is, is taken aback. It's, it's weird. This administration has always been, love them, not love them, pretty savvy about the PR of things and uh, the dread word, the optics of things. On this one, they messed all that up in a way that is almost startling. And I would say, could I just back up uh, David's point? It seems to me this White House thought desertion on the field of battle was like not handing in your homework or dropping out of Yale Law after one year. Do you know what I mean? They have no idea what that means. But they've gone even further where there are anonymous White House aides have talked about swift boating, accused their yes. opponents of swift boating. They now have called uh, you know, the person in question, honorable, and question the motives of people yeah. in the unit who, who are calling into question lives. a wrong narrative. It's probably a good thing that these, these uh, aides remain anonymous because they should be fired under those circumstances. <laughs> uh, you know, this is not badly handled. It, it, obviously, on the information side, it was fire ready aim. You know, I mean, they had one thing in mind the announcement, and obviously didn't do the backstory. Um, but I am struck that every day I pick up the paper, including this morning, there are actually two stories in this morning's paper I found really interesting. One was that he was kept in a cage, um, and obviously that would have affected his mental state. But the other was just this was a forlorn unit out in the middle of nowhere in an incredibly dangerous environment, had trouble with its commanding officer. You're just finding out more stuff every day. And this is an onion I'd keep peeling before I, 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 find, I, I drew my final conclusion. I, I agree with that up to a point. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, I th learning that he may have been in a cage certainly humanizes him and makes you more sympathetic toward him. I think we've been, and the death threats against his parents were just outrageous. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there, if, if what we see over the next few days is a series of stories that explain, well, he was in this unruly human, no, you know, nobody was disciplined, and he was a romantic, he just sort of wandered off, he was sort of in a daze, he was a young kid. Um, all of that may be true, but the fundamental fact is this. We have a tacit code in this country that if you serve in the military, our obligation to you is that if you, if you, if you get lost, you get captured, we're going to come get you. But you have an obligation to us, and that is when you're in uniform, you stay on your post. You do not leave your post. You do not leave your buddies. And you know this from your Air Force days. I was, I was in the Navy. And there were just certain things you did not do. And I think we cannot lose sight of that, even as we understand there are mitigating circumstances even as we understand that he was treated very, very badly. It is still fundamentally true. You have to get, we need his side of the story, but if he deliberately walked away, that's a serious matter, and it did leave his buddies, his, his, com his comrades in danger. That's all I'm saying, we need his side of the story. Yeah. Well, let's hope we that. get it. Yeah. What I'm saying <laughs> is let him tell the yeah. story. Stop making